Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and today's title is The Vance versus Waltz Debate. You know, we've heard the pundits now, uh, after the debate, we've heard many pundits uh, give their opinion about how the debate went and three common themes I've heard uh, and I've taken note of, and that is that the debate more or less was a tie, that the debate, uh, each candidate was uh, demonstrating quite a bit of civility towards one another, and last but not least, that the debate really won't move the poll numbers all that much, and particularly won't move the poll numbers that much in the swing states. But I noticed a lot of other things uh, with the candidates, uh, particularly Vance on, on, a, on a variety of issues. And so to discuss that with me today is my co-host, Jay Fidel. Uh, good morning, Hi, Jay. Tim. Hi, Tim. Hey, um, what's your 30,000 foot overview of the debate uh, before I drill down and ask you more specific uh, questions about your opinion about it? You know, you're right to cite an altitude on this because it depends where you're coming from. You know, if it's uh, you or me, we live in our bubble, our democratic bubble, and we want Tim Walls to shine. We want him to come out swinging. Um, if we are, you know, Trumpers or J.D. Vancers, we come out differently. If we are the press, uh, either a fact writer or an opinion writer, we come out differently. And indeed, the press is like all over the lot. It's a scatter chart of opinion about how this went. If we are in the base, you know, that's one thing. If we are a Trumper, that's one thing. If we are independent. So what I'm saying is it depends on what altitude you come from, what, you know, community you come from and how you judge this. It's something for everybody, if you will. But I agree with you that, it, you know, it seems like mostly this was a tie. It was a tie. But a lot of people feel that, that Vance won this because he's so slick. Slick is my word, but a lot of the people in the media use the word smooth. That's the kind of euphemism for slick. Um, and I kept seeing, you know, Yale Law School, and I kept seeing, you know, his experience in debating. He's an experienced debater. He knows how to deflect the question. He knows how not to answer a question. He knows how to change the subject. He it was, it was doing that a lot last night. But all in all, um, I would say it, it did not meet my hopes and expectations. I'm sorry, Tim. That's okay, Jay, because I'm sure there's others that agree with you. <clears throat> hey, you know, um, when I, and I'll use the term Yale polished, very polished Yale graduate. Uh, what I saw uh, J.D. Vance do is serve J.D. Vance. Uh, I almost felt like he was running for president. And so the question is, do you think Donald Trump was well served by this debate as uh, J.D. Vance was his number two guy, which didn't seem like he was his number two guy? You know, you, you predicted that uh, Trump would have a negative reaction to what, what Vance was doing, and you were right. Uh, there was an article in the paper this morning about how uh, this is not likely to have pleased Trump uh, for that very reason. He was not acting like number two. He was acting like number one. And, and indeed, you know, if you watched him for a while, you kept thinking, hmm, this guy could be, might be president one day. Can he handle it? Uh, he, was, he was presenting himself as a future president. Um, nothing like Trump. He could put a sentence together. And for that reason, I imagine that Trump was not happy. We'll see more. We'll see more what Trump you know, puts out on social media. If he's smart, he'll keep his mouth shut. But then he, he's never let that happen before. Uh, he hasn't. So, so, <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you, I think I take your point. It's a good point. Yeah. You know, John McCain had his uh, Sarah Palin um, albatross around his neck. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons John McCain didn't do all that well against uh, Barack Obama uh, in the in that campaign. Uh, did J.D. Vance uh, alleviate the concerns that some may have, uh, either independents or, or GOP uh, or mega followers, that uh, Donald Trump, possibly given his age, uh, may not finish a term out? Oh, yeah. 
definitely. You know, I, I, I favor the Democrats for sure, but I kept seeing that. I kept seeing him as the guy who would succeed Trump if Trump fails in some way. If Trump gets sick, falls off, gets a sad, who knows what. Um, I, and I kept seeing him that. And he was presenting that way. I also saw him as the successor, you know, because the vice president, if he's, you know, behaves himself at all or herself, um, you know, he's going to get to be the president the next term around. And that and that was pretty scary because what I know about Vance is he's bad news. He lies and he has strange, may I say, weird uh, kinds of kinds of approaches to things. My favorite comment, by the way, last night was in the spin room where Pritzker, who's the governor of Illinois, called him a number of times. He called Vance mini-me, <laughs> which I think is perfectly. If there's a takeaway from all of this, it's Pritzker's, Pritzker's characterization of Vance as mini-me. A new moniker versus weird. OK, I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I like to do when I watch a debate is I like to turn the volume down and, and just watch the candidates. And I hate to say this, but um, Tim Waltz, the visuals that I saw, at least for at least half of the debate, were not comforting me. Comforting to me, uh, he looked fidgety, uh, extremely nervous. Uh, you had a hard time focusing at looking at the camera. He's looking down at his notes most of the time, and I didn't like that. Um, now, fortunately, Tim Waltz did come to the party eventually. I think his nerves settled down, and uh, he did far, far better. Uh, as the evening grew on, but uh, your your thoughts about the nonverbal, like a like a boxing match. I wonder if he had some fast advice during the commercial breaks. I wonder if somebody could rush up on the stage and give him some advice and say, you know, look at the camera, don't look so intimidated. But in terms of uh, you know your question, I I thought that he looked terrified uh, when when he turned to his right. Um, to look at Vance, uh, he looked like he was being intimidated by what Vance was saying. Uh, he looked like he didn't have any control. When he wrote everything down copiously like that and then looked at it, it looked like, you know, Vance was teaching him things. It looked like um, he needed to make a record because he couldn't remember or he didn't have any confidence that he would remember what, what Vance was saying and what he needed to say. Um, now, now, I remember that uh, Buttigieg was his primary coach for this. I don't think that Buttigieg get, did a good job because what we wanted to hear is, is a pushback. We wanted to hear, uh, you know, because there was no uh, fact checking, that, that was a mistake by CBS, as far as I'm concerned. And v Vance was really not, um, Vance was lying all the way through. Many, many, many lies. And all the newspaper reports said that, admitted that, whatever persuasion you were. And uh, unfortunately, Tim, Tim Walsh was not prepared to catch him on the lies. He was too mm, intimidated. He was too nervous to actually focus. It reminded me in a, in a funny way of the Biden uh, performance in the, in the debate with Trump. He was, you know, he was overprepared. Uh, with numbers and you know references and all that, and he couldn't think straight. He mm -hmm. couldn't listen, as you said. He couldn't listen to what Vance was saying, and therefore he could not, you know, argue with what Vance was saying. And I really, for, furthermore, I, I, I didn't like. Um, you know, I thought maybe writing the notes down was a message to the audience that they should write it down too, because this guy Vance was lying. You know, but but I think a bit later about that, and I, I don't think that was the message. I think they saw it as a, a lack of confidence rather than uh, right. a, a message to write everything down. But finally, let me let me say that I, I thought his um, body language and his, um, he, he kept agreeing with Vance. And Vance took that, that Vance kind of wanted that. And so the two of them are, uh, you know, are agreeing with each other on so many points. I said to myself, what is this about? This is a fight to the death. This is a fight for the leadership of the free world. The stakes could not be higher. What are they agreeing with each other about? I can see that Vance wants to agree and, and you know, present himself as reasonable, more reasonable than Trump. 
but not Walls. Walls should be attacking him. He doesn't have to yell at him. He doesn't have to call him names, but he should disagree on misstatements of fact. And he didn't do that. Right. Even his strongest statement about January 6th was not very strong. And so I, I think you, you know, and the paper said this, or one of the articles, one of the various articles in the paper said, you know, he had opportunities, many opportunities to call Vance out, and he didn't. Now, what is the debate for? You know, you've got to test the other side, not agree with everything the other side is saying. And furthermore, if he agrees with a point, there are so many tens of millions of people out there that will say, ah, he's agreeing with Vance. Vance must be right about everything. That was the problem. So the message was, you know, I'm not only agreeing with you about this point you just made, and we can kiss and hug about it. I'm agreeing with you in general. That's the way it came over, I'm sure, to tens of millions of people. And that's why Vance, in my view, for them, won. Mm -hmm. Because he made a statement. It was filled with lies. And Tim Walsh agreed. And the agreement carried forward, not only to that statement, but lots of other statements. So what you have is one guy on the top, one guy on the bottom. Yeah, you know, let's talk about the top for Vance. And, uh, you know, uh, we could cite a lot of things where he was just telling whoppers. But the ones that came to my mind as the biggest whopper was how uh, Donald Trump salvaged the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. I mean, I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> I mean, that was just blatant. And to, to Tim Waltz's credit, he did catch that one and, uh, you know, did, did refute it. Um, and then, of course, the very last one was at the end of the debate where, where Tim Walsh did come to the party, finally, and uh, I think landed some pretty significant blows on the chin of Vance, and that centered over um, the transference of power on January 6th. And, um, you know, the, the right, the, the Capitol riot. And, and uh, Tim Walsh point blank asked him a question, you know, did, did he... Donald Trump transfer power. And uh, you saw Vance's response. He, he was on the back of his heels. He didn't know that question. Your thought about the uh, other points of, how should I say, uh, alternative facts, um, lies that Vance was waiting in, and um, whether Tim Waltz caught him on those or not? Well, uh, there were many of them. Um, I mean, uh, questions of abortion, immigration. Um, he, he lied about what Trump's position was and what his position has been. Um, and uh, I don't think that Walsh would come at it. You know, it, I guess it's the, the sign of an inexperienced um, debater. He would come in from his point of view and he would state his view of it. But he wouldn't say that Vance was wrong. He wouldn't right. say that Vance was lying. He didn't say that. Everybody was being so accommodating, you know. Um, so it, it Mid really Midwestern did... nice. Yeah. And even even the high point, which I agree with you, he he hit him good on the chin uh, when he asked him, you know, do, do you agree that um, that uh, Biden won the election or a question like that at the end? And uh, uh, predictably, Vance said, you know, deflected the question, didn't answer it. Uh, to, you know, actually, MSNBC made it clear there were many, many, many questions that Vance did not answer. He's really good at that. And a debater, or for that matter, a litigator in an appellate argument, you know, doesn't answer questions. You know, or in a deposition, a witness doesn't answer questions. And what are you going to do? You have to ask the question again and again. And I did not think the moderators pursued that. It was one of the moderators would repeat the question. I think she repeated it once or twice, uh, and then let it go. They let him go, yeah. uh, you know. And you can say, well, okay, they're not responsible for um, you know, fact checking. Okay, all right, fine, I, mistake, but fine. But but they are responsible to get an answer to their bloody question. Yeah. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that. What you have to do is repeat the question. When I when I was practicing, I. I, I always spotted that because that was a waste of my time for if this guy sailing off into the sunset about, you know, his agenda and not answering my question. And I would say to him, I would say, ah, 
Thank you very much. Let me rephrase my question. And then I would then I would ask the guy precisely the same question again. And, and the next time, the same thing. Let me rephrase that. And it was the same question. So, you know, you got to make it clear for the record that he's not answering the question. And unfortunately, the moderators, whose job it was, did not do that. And, um, you know, as, as I mentioned, I was disappointed uh, that uh, uh, Tim Waltz did not do that either. Uh, at the very end, you know, at the very, you know, two minutes before the end, um, he called them on the January 6th issue. By then, how many people in the country at, what, 88 minutes in were still listening? Um, arguably, you could say, well, he was saving his biggest missile up for the very last of the, of the uh, debate. Um, and that was a strategy. But I don't think so. Because that strategy would ignore the fact that most people um, do not have the ability to watch more than X minutes. And they weren't watching at 88 minutes in. So it was lost on a huge number of people uh, who had already concluded that Vance won the debate. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think nice, but too late. Well, I'd like to tag on to your comment about Buddha Judge and his tutelage on this debate. And, you know, as you're watching Tim Waltz, I mean, he is taking notes as if he's listening, but it's never, he never referred back to his notes. And, and you're right. Um, you know, uh, you take notes cause you're listening, but what good are the notes? If you never go back to them and say, well, wait a minute, that's not true. Cause you said this or this or this. And, and that never occurred. I, not hardly at all. And I, I found that disappointing. Cause I, I agree that if you're a debate candidate, uh, the fundamental principle of debate is a know your positions, know your arguments, be able to support your arguments and your claims, but most importantly, listen to what your opponent is saying and, and use that um, to refute or not refute a position. And I just didn't see that from Tim Waltz, and I was disappointed as well on that. Um, follow up to this is, do you think J.D. Vance in any way intimidated the moderators? Uh, did he not once during the thing going, you, you're not supposed to be fact checking me? Uh, didn't he yeah. say that to, I don't know if it was to Nora O'Donnell or, or who he said it to, but uh, he claimed, he said, you're not supposed to be fact-checking me. Yeah, and that was a CBS mistake, huge 10-foot mistake, by agreeing to a format where they would not fact-check him. Why do that? You know the guy is a, a committed liar. He, you know, he lies when he opens his mouth. And, and, and you know, the previous uh, debate, um, was very good because the moderators called out Donald Trump when he lied on at least a couple of points, but they never they never agreed to call him out, and they never did call him out except maybe that one time, which actually the report was by you know, the media was that she wasn't fact checking him; she was merely making a statement, and he took that as a fact check which was really not accurate. He, I guess he wanted to do the same thing that Trump did. He wanted to blame the moderators. Um, did it work? Because in some ways, I think it did work. That there was yeah. a, the, a level of intimidation that they, uh, you, you made the observation that they, um, they didn't get an answer. Maybe they'd ask the same question twice, but that was it. Then they dropped it. Um, did he have an effect that prevented them from at least doing their jobs of getting an answer to their direct question? Oh, I agree. There was an intimidation feature, but my my way of looking at it would be this. Everybody in the room, if not the country, was aware that this guy is a slick debater. He's a Yale law slick debater. That's that's his this is best talent, as a matter of fact, because he's not talented in anything else, maybe writing books about hillbilly elegy kind thing. Um, but in fact, you know, when you get up there and you're so glib and you don't even breathe between your sentences, that's intimidating. And, and I'm sure they were having the same reaction that I was having um, and that Walsh was having is, oh, my God, this guy is so articulate, so glib. He's got a, you know, a flowing answer for every question. Doesn't even repeat himself. He's got it all up his sleeve like that. And I think the country looked at it that way, and especially the people, you know, in the red states, in the bubble. They looked at it that way. And so um, they they may not have been intimidated, 
But the people in the room, that is the moderators and Tim Walsh, were definitely intimidated by the articulate power of this debater. The people in the red states, they weren't, our, they weren't uh, intimidated. They were impressed. They thought, wow, this guy's terrific. Well, let me let me tag onto that because you know, as I was watching this, I'm saying JD Vance is actually speaking so well and so polished that he may be speaking above his audience. And I'm talking about uh, some of the, you know, the Southern Midwest, um, you know, non-college educated uh, followers of Trump. And I got the sense that JD Vance was speaking above them, um, not necessarily down at them, but above them. Your thoughts? Very good, very good issue, very good point, because that was the the big distinction, okay? J.D. Vance is talking like a Yale Law graduate, big vocabulary, you know, smooth, slick, had it all up his sleeve, um, didn't have to make notes, didn't make notes. He knew what he had to say, and he could respond or come up with stuff, and he could deflect questions, and you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even feel him slide by the question. Okay, that's pretty good, and and you know you have to admire that if you care about these um, these East Coast slick guys. On the other hand, you know Tim Walsh played the card, and maybe Buddha Judge told him to. So you got to be a down home guy. You mm -hmm. got to be a guy from a small town. You know, who has a home and family, and you know one of the people grassroots come in grassroots. Um, I don't think that worked because, you know, when you when you get down to it, it's just like a, a court argument. When you get down to it, it's how well the lawyer or the debater presents. And Tim was tentative on so many things um, that, yeah, he might have been trying to do the down home thing. Um, but that doesn't win the ball game. The ball game is won by the guy who seems to know what he's talking about, even if he doesn't. So I think the. The contention between the Yale debater and the guy from a small town in where was it, Wisconsin, um, that that didn't work. That was not a good strategy. The other thing is, I think that Tim was uh, uh, overprepared, yeah. um, just like Biden was overprepared. He, in other words, the question would come, um, and he would not be listening, as you said, um, to Vance. He wouldn't be able to wrap around what Vance said and attack it. Instead, it was just a string in his back. Somebody pulled a string and he gave, you know, an answer that he had practiced and that Buddha Judge told him to have it already. But that's not good debating. You you have to deal with what the other guy's saying, and he didn't do that. So he was unpersuasive. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great observation, and I think you're spot on. Uh, yeah, I saw. I like the visual that you paint, that there was a string in his back and it was merely being pulled and he spit out what he had to spit out. Uh, we're almost out of time here. Do the polls shift at all as a result of this vice president debate, uh, spe specifically or particularly in these swing states? Too early to say. You know, even the polls after, after the uh, first debate, um, they, didn't, they didn't swing much right away. It takes a while for it to settle in. It takes a while for people to develop um, you know an opinion about it to, to read about it hear about it and talk in the barbershop about it you know whatever and i don't think that there's been time i mean we we're talking about where it's only what 12 hours away less than one day away right now mm -hmm. um but i think at the end of the day the problem is it's like it's like uh if vance had the coin flip as to who to go that whether to go last any reasonable lawyer or debater would make the choice of going last. It's the last statement that leaves the people watching the debate or the jury or a jury wave trial, the judge, with the last impression, the last argument. That's the one that lingers for you. Okay? Mm -hmm. So no question he was going to use that, toy, that coin flip to go last. Good choice for him. OK, and he made his point. If it had been the other way, maybe maybe Tim Walsh would have had a better, you know, closing. I mean, his closing was OK. It was great. It, it was OK. But but um, it wasn't the last thing said. And what, what, what I mean is, if you're looking for a public policy shift, a polls shift, 
it's the last statements that have the greatest effect. And to that point, I, I think that's where Tim Waltz really did get some points uh, racked up on the scoreboard is that his, you know, before the closing statements, uh, he really did make that point about uh, January 6th and Donald Trump's involvement with that. And I think that's a point of this debate that Americans may remember, um, particularly the fact that Vance was flailing a, a bit on trying to respond to that. And it was clear that he was avoiding the question uh, whether or not um, Joe Biden won that election or not in 2020. So I, I think your point's well made. And I think if I feel at all good about Walsh's performance, it, it did come for the last uh, checkup or check in on um, on democracy and uh, January 6th. So who knows? Uh, last question. Uh, was Donald Trump and Kamala Harris served well by this debate? I think Vance and, and, um, and Trump were distinguished, I mean, as separate thinkers here. Uh, he was trying to be accommodate Trump as much as he could because that's the job of the vice president. It's the job of the running mate. <clears throat> and he did, you know, try hard to do that. But the fact is that he was much more articulate and focused. If you could say that lying like that is focused, I'm not sure. It's, he focused lying is what he was doing. Um, but um I, I'm not sure that he did serve Trump's interests, and I'm not sure that Trump would be happy. I think in the case of uh, Tim Walz and Kamala Harris, you know, he, he, he Tim, uh, backed her up all the way. Uh, he quoted her. He extolled her, you know, virtues. Mm -hmm. uh, he made it clear that he saw the vice presidency as somebody who would support the president, and, and he supported her. So she was probably happy. But, you know, in general, I think um, the mission was, and Buttigieg probably saw it this way too, you know, it's, it was Tim Walz's opportunity to lose. It was his to lose. And, and the important thing is not to lose it. So if it came out close, that's exactly what Buttigieg would have wanted. That's exactly what Kamala Harris would have wanted. Not a not a, a slug fest, um, you know, just a an even an even handed, um, even a kindly um, debate where nobody really wins big, and nobody is mean, and that what that means is it has very little effect on who's going to win the presidency. I mean, that's the way I would think they were thinking. So I think I think Kamala Harris was happy enough that Tim Walsh did not lose the thing, not outright anyway. And Buttigieg was probably happy that he did not lose the thing. Yeah, uh, I think I was disappointed. I was disappointed, but maybe I shouldn't be. Uh, maybe yeah. I should be happy enough to have the whole thing refer back to the previous debate where clearly Trump lost. Correct. You know, as I was watching this, I was, you know, looking at the contrast and I'm thinking of the old GOP that really don't care for Trump, but, you know, they've been in the GOP for all their lives and they're going to vote GOP. Um, I kept thinking about those particular uh, supporters of Trump and the how the contrast between how Vance operates on the stage and how he responds to questions and how he answers questions was so 180 degrees on how Donald Trump uh behaves on in front of a camera or at the podium. And I'm, I was thinking about this old GOP folks going, gee, I kind of miss that. I kind of miss having a normal politician uh, representing my interests and setting policies. So be as it may, that's kind of what I took out of it, is uh, the real contrast between Vance and Trump and uh, how that, in many ways, did not serve Donald Trump very well. But that's just me. I, I absolutely agree. You have a different personality altogether. Yeah. Neither one of them is very attractive. But what you know, where I got caught though is that he presented himself as so reasonable, as you say, old-fashioned Republican trying to be reasonable. In fact, he 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 shoved off from all of those outrageous statements that he's been making over the past few weeks. And you you really have to follow this and have a memory about it, like we do, hopefully. Um, and and to make the and to make the comparison about what he said last night as opposed to 
all the crazy, wild, irresponsible statements that he's made over the past few weeks. I'm not sure the country makes that distinction. Yeah. Well, true disclosure here, um, my memory's getting overloaded. <laughs> There's so much. <laughs> it's a fire hose of information and alternative facts sometimes. One last thought, Tim. Okay, as I said, you know, you don't you don't have an immediate poll reaction because it takes a little while to sink in. And that means that public public opinion takes a little while to sink in. And we have to follow what happens here. Now there'll be other you know um other actions, interactions going forward, because everything's moving at breakneck speed. We're what are we, a month away? And uh, that, that, that's that that's only a moment in time. Um, and so the question is, what effect, good, bad, or otherwise, is this debate going to have on the final election? Let me ask you that question. I don't think it moves the needle very much. Um, if anything, it helps Walsh because he did come off as Midwestern nice. And uh, I think that helps him, even though he was nervous and his performance was a little uh, shaky at first, or at least the half of the debate. Um, I think it gives... Uh, those who want to vote for Harris but aren't sure, I, I think they saw in Tim Waltz um, a bit of themselves. And I think that helps. Yeah, I agree with you. All right. Well, we've run out of time, Jay. I want to thank you very much for your comments. This is Tim Apicella, and I am host for American Issues Take One. Why don't you join us next week? And until then, aloha. <laughs>